what do you think about, well, architecture more broadly, Gary, and um, not just this context, but just more generally? Um, many years ago, 40, 45 years ago, I had aspirations of uh, becoming an architect. Unfortunately, those aspirations were, were destroyed when I was 15 years old, when um, in a little racist enclave in the north coast of New South Wales where I was going to school, a uh, vocational guidance officer, supposedly, said to me, or asked me, uh, what I would like to do when I left school. And I rashly said, um, I'd like to be an architect, which produced a look of shock and horror on this vocational guidance person, who then pointed out to me that as an Aboriginal, uh, such an aspiration was um, impossible, and that if I worked really hard and studied uh, long and hard, if I was really lucky, I might be able to one day become a motor mechanic. Now, that sort of demolished my um, self-esteem, it demolished my self-confidence to such an extent that um, um, I reacted against that and I was thrown out of school six months later and it took me another 30 years before I believed in myself enough again to actually go to university. I went to Melbourne University at the grand old age of 48, uh, completed my PhD not so long ago, uh, won, the vice, uh, won the Chancellor's Award for Excellence for my PhD at the University of Melbourne, allegedly Australia's number one university. Uh, it's just pity that I, uh, I don't know whatever happened to that vocational officer because I would have liked to uh, invited her to my PhD ceremony, but there you go. Um, so I, I, like I say, I, I seriously had, you know, I seriously thought that architecture was something that I, I could do. Um, I eventually, when I did leave school, I became a draftsman, um, worked for a firm of consulting engineers in Sydney and uh, also in the, de the old Department of Works, Federal Department of Works. Uh, and as a drafts person, I was um, I, I was a mechanical design draftsman specialising in the design of ducted air conditioning systems in multi-storey buildings. Just I used to say to my Aboriginal comrades, just exactly what Aboriginal Australia needed at that time in history, you know. But uh, luckily, by the time I was 22, just after I completed my uh, uh, formal training as a draftsman. Um, the Aboriginal Embassy broke in Canberra and I had a choice. Do I stay here and stay in the Department of Works and become a nine to five Aboriginal person? Uh, or do I go and be with my brothers and sisters at the Aboriginal Embassy? I left work as a draftsman, never worked as a draftsman again since, which is probably very fortuitous because these days, um, if I was still a drafts person, I would have been replaced by computers a long time ago, you know. So I was probably lucky in that sense. Although I did, you know, when I did go to university, I, uh, by then um, I'd spent half my life making history and I'd got a bit uh, disillusioned with the way in which the history that I'd been part of was being uh, represented by various historians, so I decided to become one of them one of the things that I hated the most, an academic historian, uh, which I am to this day, folks. Um, so, but as I said, the Aboriginal Embassy, <laughs> you said to me earlier on, just uh, I'll just ask you one question, you keep going. Yeah, I'll sit down. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's lucky in a sense that the Aboriginal Embassy was the thing that took me away from my um, career as a drafts person because um, in many ways, this sort of pavilion thing here, to me, is just a flash version, a postmodern version of the Aboriginal Embassy, which was a temporary structure, a structure where Aboriginal people, and not just Aboriginal people, but it was a place for discussion and debate 
and uh, action. And the other thing about this particular structure that strikes me, and uh, when Naomi was talking earlier on, she mentioned various other temporary pavilions that have existed in these surrounds. Um, she uh, forgot to mention uh, one of the most significant ones, which just, was just over the road here, uh, during the Commonwealth Games, um, the Stolen Wealth Games, as Robbie Thorpe calls them, uh, which was what was called Camp Sovereignty, which was a Melbourne version of the Aboriginal Embassy. And the interesting difference that I perceive in this uh, structure and, and, the, and in what's going on here today uh, and the Camp Sovereignty uh, pavilion, if you like, is that at least being here today, I can't see an army of coppers surrounding us, you know, and hassling us. Uh, so there's an interesting difference in what m appears to be acceptable to society uh, and what isn't acceptable to society. And I haven't read, uh, not that I read the Herald Scum newspaper, but I haven't read uh, Andrew Bolt kicking up a stink about, you know, this uh, pavilion here either, which is what he was kicking up a stink about when the other, our pavilion was over the road here. So there's, you know, some interesting sort of comparisons here. The other thing I'd probably mention, um, Sean uh, right at the beginning when I was listening to him, um, um, suggested that he was seeking some, to sort of m make this a sort of an Australian space. I'd merely suggest that to make it a genuinely Australian space, uh, we'd need a, a little fire in the middle, you know, have a hole in the roof so the smoke can go through. But it really needs to be a fire there and we'd probably need dirt floor. Other than that, and a few Aboriginal flags maybe, but um, um, it's an interesting idea. And the other thing I'd say to Sean, is he around? No. Oh, he's gone, so I can say this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I noticed in uh, Sean's statement uh, that I read that he spoke in the first uh, sentence about that the Australian landscape is a confusion of innate brutality and introduced refinement. Now, I would probably contest that <laughs> as a perception and an, as an analysis. Um, and I, I don't think I necessarily agree either with his proposition that uh, it seemed to me that, in a sense, he was uh, suggesting that a genuine Australian landscape is necessarily is partly composed of a desert. Now, I don't go along with that. I moved to Melbourne 42 years ago, and I live in Melbourne, and I love Melbourne because it's not a desert. I don't want to live in a desert, and I don't perceive desert as being a, an authentic uh, proposition of Australianness, you know, but then I'm a bit crazy and some of my desert brothers and sisters would probably disagree with me on this, but, you know, to each their own. Um, the other interesting thing that I'd just say about my perception of this pavilion, um, and no, not casting any aspersions on anyone who's spoken today, but it seems to me to be fairly Eurocentric bunch we've all had up here with possibly exception to me, even though some of the things I'm saying are a bit weird. Um, and that, to me, uh, doesn't detract from this space, but one of the reasons that I've always said that I love Melbourne, I've lived in Melbourne for 42 years, a thousand miles away from the little racist enclave that I grew up in in northern New South Wales, one of the things I love about Melbourne is that Melbourne, to me, uh, is the least racist capital city on mainland Australia. If it wasn't for Melbourne, I couldn't live in Australia. Uh, and I believe that a significant part of the reason why Melbourne is like it is has to do with significant groups in the Melbourne community who are, uh, who are the non-Anglo uh, segment of the Australian community. In particular, the Greek community, the Italian community, and various other non-Anglo communities that have uh, made such a significant contribution to the broader economic, political and social sort of fabric of Melbourne in a way in which hasn't happened in places like Sydney, where you've got uh, communities who are much more ghettoised, as distinct from Melbourne where I perceive, you know, 
And I, you know, and that's a, an important part of why I love Melbourne so much and which to me makes Melbourne such a significant place. And um, I think it would have been good to have a few more um, people like that. Actually, it's interesting, yeah. Mike. Can I, can yep. I cut in? Um, uh, my brother-in-law, who's uh, uh, his family Italian migrants and grew up in Noble Park, saw you in 1982 uh, when you got up on stage with The Clash. He's obsessed with The Clash. And uh, he's an 18-year-old kid from Noble Park into punk. And then they're playing Armageddon in time and they invite you up on stage. Uh, for the duration of that song and he said I went to search long and hard to find a bootleg of Gary Foley because he collects all the bootlegs and this is one and he found it and then last night he, he, he said it's probably just online and it is online have you seen have you heard it yep and so there are three <laughs> you have heard it yeah um, and there are three people you mention in that so you're talking about uh, marching mm. for Aboriginal uh, land rights mm talking about uh, gender equality um, and there are three people you mentioned and I couldn't hear their names and if you, s you talk to three of them and, and with each of them if you, if you said you didn't like them then you're with us. Could you <laughs> tell me who those people are? Sorry it's a little bit, uh, I think Hancock was one? Uh, well Joe Bajogi Peterson was certainly oh, one okay. of them. Okay. Uh, for the, those of you who are old enough to remember our dearly beloved and, and highly eccentric Queensland Premier, even more eccentric than our current Queen, well our Queensland Premier for today. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the clash. Joe Strummer, he was a great man. I mean, I don't know. I'm sure Joe's sitting up there somewhere listening thinking, wow, I'm getting a mention in this discussion about architecture and design, you know. He'd been buzzed by that. Um, what can I say about the clash, folks, you know? So it's about how, did you, how did you get to be? Joe Strummer rung me up and asked me to... Right. When the clash... I mean, this is really boring for those of you who are not interested in music and punk music. But um, when the, wherever The Clash went in their heyday in the world, uh, Joe Strummer tried to find um, people in whatever local community they were playing in who didn't have a voice or who were, who were essentially powerless and who, who were involved in a struggle for justice. And, and Joe Strummer believed that um, it was important for in terms of the politics of the, the band, that they create opportunities for those who are powerless to have a voice. And so uh, Joe Strummer identified correctly that the most oppressed people in the Australian community in 1982 were the Aboriginal community, and he rang me up and, and offered to give us a voice. And I did seven concerts around Australia with um, The Clash. And uh, as you just said, they're still to this day, I mean, you know, young people, come up to me all over the place and say, hey, you're the guy who I saw with The Clash. And I say, well, I have done a few other things yeah. in my life, you know. <laughs> I say, no, man, you're the guy in The Clash. Or you're the guy from Dogs in Space. <laughs> so I did want to also ask you just about the Tent Embassy. So it started with, uh, you know, a banana lounge and an umbrella and became, you know, tents. And it sits there next to the, the kind of edifice of Old Parliament House and is now a permanent, is that right? It's now a permanent, uh, it it's seems not heritage, be. but it's... Yeah. I, when I talk about the Aboriginal Embassy, and I, my PhD is actually about the Aboriginal Embassy in 72, I usually uh, specific, very specifically mean the structure that existed from January 1972, uh, 26th of January 1973 to the 30th of July. 1972 when it got smashed by, uh, knocked down by the police. Um, but the Aboriginal Embassy came into being because a bunch of us in Sydney in what was known as the Black Power Movement uh, objected to the Prime Minister's statement on Australia Day 1972 where he was under pressure with a lot of the political activity was going on at the time and he felt the need, this is Billy McMahon, for those of you who are old enough to remember silly Billy McMahon, our, another um, of our eccentric Australian politicians. Billy McMahon felt compelled to make a statement about Aboriginal land rights. And he stupidly sto chose a very contested day to do it, to make this statement. If you're gonna make a statement saying to Aboriginal people, go to hell, you're not gonna get land rights, then it's not a smart thing to do it on a day 
that we know as Invasion Day and that is known as Australia Day to others because it just rubbing our nose in it. And so our reaction was to send a bunch of people to Canberra that night. We were determined to uh, get a picture in the Canberra Times the next day so that Billy McMahon, the Prime Minister, would wake up and see that Aboriginal people had rejected his land rights statement. The whole idea was simply for, for these four guys to set up a tent, get a photo taken. We, we believed that they'd be arrested. We said to them, you know, you'll get pinched. Uh, spend the night in the cells, it's probably going to be warmer in the cells in Canberra than on the lawn, and we'll come down and bail you out tomorrow. That was the plan, it was simple as that. Uh, but it went terribly wrong when the police arrived after the boys set up their, their umbrella and their tent, and the police uh, said, uh, a bit of artistic licence, don't seem to be looking at the law book in Canberra, the police sergeant, federal police sergeant, hmm, don't seem to be any law against camping on the lawns. And the boys said, what? And the copper said, there's no law against camping on the lawn as long as you only put 11 tents here. He said, you put 12 tents here and we can deem you a camping area. And the copper got in his car and drove away. The boys had <laughs> accidentally found a loophole in Canberra law. And there was nothing that uh, the police would do. There was nothing the government could do without introducing a new law, making it illegal. And so for six months, we, we were there. And uh, the Aboriginal Embassy in 1972 attracted uh, worldwide attention. Uh, media um, outfits from 70 different countries uh, put us on the map in the international political arena. And the whole world suddenly knew that there was a, an issue in Australia that involved Indigenous people and involved land. And uh, we've never looked back. Well, we've never got land rights still, 40 years later. Uh, we've got this Mickey Mouse thing they call native title, which is a fraud and um, is not land rights at all. But, you know, Australians uh, have been conned into thinking that we've got justice, but we ain't. <laughs> And so you don't recognise it after that day in 72, so when Tony Abbott more recently suggested something ought to be done about the tent embassy, I mean, what... Well, what I mean, uh, the embassy went back up again. Gough Whitlam became Prime Minister at the end of 72. We had great expectations. He, we were pro he promised us land rights. Um, and he promised us land rights as a result of the Aboriginal embassy being there. He went over to visit the Aboriginal embassy uh, on, in February 1972 making a big speech like politicians like doing. Don't get me wrong, I love Whitlam, but he did the wrong thing by us. He got up making a speech saying, vote for the ALP and you will get justice. Uh, and Paul Coe, one of our activists, jumped up and challenged Whitlam. He said, well, hang on, Whitlam. Your party, political party, the ALP, your policy on Aborigines is assimilation. Across the road, the government, Billy McMahon, the Liberal Party, their policy on Aborigines is assimilation. Assimilation equals genocide. Why should we vote for the ALP? Gough Whitlam, to his credit, realised the, the logic and the merit in what Coe was saying, and uh, Gough Whitlam overnight personally changed the policy of the ALP. And they went to the 72 federal election promising land rights for Aboriginal people. And it didn't happen. So 12 months later, the embassy went back up again, uh, where it remains to this day. So that's a, it's, to me, it's a different entity, but um, you know, it's still there talking about the same issue, which is land rights, which is uh, you know, ad what Aboriginal people need to es establish their own, our own political, economic independence. But that's a long debate. I'll tell you about that another time, folks. <laughs>